Irony as a Controlled Element The Truth of Irony by Soren Kierkegaard It has already been pointed out in the foregoing that in his Lectures on Aesthetics, Soldier makes irony the condition for every artistic work. When we now in this context say that the poet must be related ironically to his writing, this means something different from what was said about this earlier. Shakespeare has frequently been eulogized as the Grand Master of Irony, and there could be no doubt that there is justification for that. But by no means does Shakespeare allow the substantive worth to evaporate into an ever more fugitive sublimate. And as for the occasional culmination of his lyrics in madness, there is an extraordinary degree of objectivity in this madness. When Shakespeare is related ironically to what he writes, it is precisely in order to let the objective dominate. Irony is now everywhere present. It sanctions every single line so that there will be neither too much nor too little, in order that everything can have its due, in order that the true balance may be achieved in the miniature world of the poem, whereby the poem has the center of gravity in itself. The greater the contrasts in the movement, the more irony is required to direct and control the spirits that willfully want to charge forward. The more irony is present, the more freely and poetically the poet floats about his artistic work. Therefore, irony is not present at some particular point of the poem, but is omnipresent in it, so that the irony visible in the poem is in turn, ironically, controlled. Therefore, irony simultaneously makes the poem and the poet free. But in order for this to happen, the poet himself must be master over the irony. But this does not always mean that just because a poet manages to be master over the irony at the time of writing he is master over it, in the actuality to which he himself belongs, it is customarily said that the poet's personal life is of no concern to us. This is absolutely right, but in the present undertaking, it should not be out of place to point out the misrelation that can often exist in this respect. In addition, the less the poet remains in the immediate position of genius, the greater becomes the significance of this misrelation. The more the poet has abandoned this, the more necessary it is for him to have a totality view of the world, and in this way to be master over irony in his individual existence. And the more necessary it becomes for him to be a philosopher to a certain degree. If this is the case, then the individual poetic work will not have a merely external relation to the poet. In the individual poem, he will see an element in his own development. The reason Goethe's poet existence was so great was that he was able to make his poet life congruous with his actuality. But that in turn takes irony. But, please note, controlled irony. For the Romanticist, the individual poetic work is either a darling favorite with which he himself is utterly infatuated, and which he cannot explain to himself. How could he possibly have given life to it? Or it is an object that arouses his disgust. Both responses, of course, are false. The truth of the matter is that the individual work is an element. In Goethe, irony was, in the strictest sense, a controlled element. It was a serving spirit to the poet. On the one hand, the individual poem rounds itself off, in itself, by means of the irony in it. On the other hand, the individual poetic work emerges as an element, and thereby the whole poetic existence rounds itself off by means of irony. As poet, Professor Heiberg takes the same position, and while almost every line of dialogue he has written can provide an example of irony's inner economy in the play. All his plays exhibit the conscious striving to assign to every particular line its place in the whole. Here, then, the irony is controlled, is reduced to an element. This essence is nothing other than the phenomenon. The phenomenon is nothing other than the essence. Possibility is not so prudish as to be unwilling to enter into any actuality, but actuality is possibility. Goethe, both the striving and the victorious Goethe, has always acknowledged this view, has continually articulated this view very energetically. After all, what holds for the poet existence holds also, in some measure, for every single individual's life. In other words, the poet does not live poetically by creating a poetic work, 
For if it does not stand in any conscious and inward relation to him, his life does not have the inner infinity that is an absolute condition for living poetically. Thus we also see poetry frequently finding an outlet through unhappy individualities. Indeed, the painful destruction of the poet is a condition for the poetic production, but he lives poetically only when he himself is oriented, and thus integrated, in the age in which he lives, is positively free in the actuality to which he belongs. But anyone can live poetically in this way. But the rare gift, the divine good fortune to be able to let what is poetically experienced take shape and form itself poetically, remains, of course, the enviable fate of the chosen few. To be controlled in this way, to be halted in the wild infinity into which it rushes ravenously by no means indicates that irony should now lose its meaning or be totally discarded. On the contrary, when the individual is properly situated, and this he is through the curtailment of irony, only then does irony have its proper meaning, its true validity. In our age, there has been much talk about the importance of doubt for science and scholarship. But what doubt is to science... Irony is to personal life. Just as scientists maintain that there is no true science without doubt, so it may be maintained with the same right that no genuinely human life is possible without irony. As soon as irony is controlled, it makes a movement opposite to that in which uncontrolled irony declares its life. Irony limits, finitizes, and circumscribes, and thereby yields truth, actuality, content. It disciplines and punishes, and thereby yields balance and consistency. Irony is a disciplinarian, feared only by those who do not know it, but loved by those who do. Anyone who does not understand irony at all, who has no ear for its whispering, lacks eo ipso, precisely thereby, what could be called the absolute beginning of personal life. He lacks what momentarily is indispensable for personal life. He lacks the bath of regeneration and rejuvenation, irony's baptism of purification that rescues the soul from having its life in finitude, even though it is living energetically and robustly in it. He does not know the refreshment and strengthening that come with undressing when the air gets too hot and heavy, and diving into the sea of irony, not in order to stay there, of course, but in order to come out healthy, happy, and buoyant and to dress again. Therefore, if at times someone is heard talking with great superiority about irony in the infinite striving in which it runs wild, one may certainly agree with him, but insofar as he does not perceive the infinity that moves in irony. He stands not above, but below irony. So it is always wherever we disregard the dialectic of life. It takes courage not to surrender to the shrewd or sympathetic counsel of despair that allows a person to erase himself from the number of the living. But this does not mean that every sausage peddler, fed and fattened on self-confidence, has more courage than the person who succumbed to despair. It takes courage when sorrow would delude one, when it would reduce all joy to sadness, all longing to privation, every hope to recollection. It takes courage to will to be happy. But this does not necessarily mean that every full-grown adult infant with his sweet, sentimental smile, his joy-intoxicated eyes, has more courage than the person who yielded to grief and forgot to smile. So it is also with irony. Even though one must warn against irony as against a seducer, so must one also commend it as a guide. Particularly in our age, irony must be commended. In our age... Scientific scholarship has come into possession of such prodigious achievements that there must be something wrong somewhere. Knowledge, not only about the secrets of the human race, but even about the secrets of God, is offered for sale at such a bargain price today that it all looks very dubious. In our joy over the achievement in our age, we have forgotten that an achievement is worthless if it is not made one's own. But woe to him who cannot bear to have irony, seek to balance the accounts. Irony as the negative is the way. It is not the truth, but the way. Anyone who has a result as such does not possess it, since he does not have the way. When irony now lends a hand, it brings the way. 
but not the way whereby someone fancying himself to have the achievement comes to possess it, but the way along which the achievement deserts him. Furthermore, if our generation has any task at all, it must be to translate the achievement of scientific scholarship into personal life, to appropriate it personally. For example, when scientific scholarship teaches that actuality has absolute validity, then the point is truly to acquire that validity, and one cannot deny that it would be most ridiculous if someone who in his youth learned, and perhaps even taught others, that actuality has absolute meaning grew old and died without actualities ever having had any other validity than his proclaiming in and out of season the wisdom that actually has validity. When scientific scholarship mediates all the opposites, then the point is that this full-bodied actuality ought truly to become visible. In another direction, there is in our day a prodigious enthusiasm and strangely enough, that which makes it enthusiastic seems to be prodigiously little. How beneficial irony can be here. There is an impatience that wants to harvest before it sows. Just let irony discipline it. In every personal life there is so much that must be thrown out, so many wild shoots to be pruned. Here again irony is an excellent surgeon, because as stated, when irony has been put under control, its function is extremely important in enabling personal life to gain health and truth. Irony as a controlled element manifests itself in its truth precisely by teaching how to actualize actuality, by placing the appropriate emphasis on actuality. In no way can this be interpreted as wanting to deify actuality in good St. Simone style, or as denying that there is or at least that there ought to be, a longing in every human being for something higher and more perfect. But this longing must not hollow out actuality. On the contrary, life's content must become a genuine and meaningful element in the higher actuality whose fullness the soul craves. Actuality hereby acquires its validity, not as a purgatory, for the soul is not to be purified in such a way that, stark naked, so to speak, it runs blank and bare out of life but as history in which consciousness successively matures, yet in such a way that salvation consists not in forgetting all this, but in becoming present in it. Actuality, therefore, will not be rejected, and longing will be a sound and healthy love, not a weak and sentimental sneaking out of the world. The romantic longing for something higher may well be genuine, but just as man must not separate what God has joined together, so man also must not join what God has separated. But a sickly longing such as this is simply a way of wanting to have the perfect prematurely. Therefore, actuality acquires its validity through action. But action must not degenerate into a kind of fatuous indefatigableness. It ought to have an a priority in itself, so as not to lose itself in a vapid infinity. So much for the practical side. On the theoretical side, essence must manifest itself as phenomenon. When irony is controlled, it no longer believes, as do shrewd people in everyday life, that there is always more than meets the eye, but it also prevents all idle worshipping of the phenomenon. And just as it teaches respect for contemplation, it also rescues it from the verbosity that believes that giving an exposition of world history, for example, should take as long a time as the world has needed to live through it. Finally, insofar as there may be a question concerning irony's eternal validity, this question can be answered only by entering into the realm of humor. Humor has a far more profound skepticism than irony, because here the focus is on sinfulness, not on finitude. The skepticism of humor is related to the skepticism of irony, as ignorance is related to the old thesis I believe because it is absurd, but it also has a far deeper positivity, since it moves not in human but in theanthropological categories. It finds rest not by making man man, but by making man god-man. Yet all this lies beyond the scope of this study, and if anyone should wish food for thought, I recommend Professor Martinson's review of Heiberg's Neidicht.